I'm Pastor Jeff Noble, and I want to thank you for watching today. At Four Winds Church, we're kind of a simple church. We believe the Bible is God's Word, and we think that we should pay attention to it. And I hope that you will pay attention to it as you watch this video, because it's all about Jesus. a seat. We're going to ask you to turn in your copy of God's Word to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. We're going to be talking about a story where Jesus is going to teach his disciples that sometimes things need to change. Now I know what you're probably thinking right now. You're probably thinking, man, I like the way things are. Well, quite frankly, I like the way things used to be. Uh, the way things are kind of a train wreck right now. Some of the things that we're seeing, some of the craziness that's going on, some of the issues that are happening, and we just look at, at the insanity of this world and our leadership, and you just kind of have to ask yourself, what are they thinking? And uh, the fact is, they're not. And they're sure not thinking according to the Word of God. Hey, greetings. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, they're not thinking about the things of God, obviously. They're making decisions based on man, and I don't know about you, but every time man makes a decision, we screw it up, don't we? We mess it up every single time. Well, there's a story in the Bible where Jesus was talking, or was, was reaching out to, his, uh, uh, to some of the guys that were going to be his disciples. One of them was a guy named Peter. Now, in my Bible here, it refers to him as Simon because Jesus would give him that name later on. But read along with me in your copy of God's Word, because we're going to see a prime example where a guy realized some things had to change in his life. And my prayer for you today, and my prayer for myself today, is recognizing when things need to be different and when they need to stay the same. Read along with me in your copy of God's Word in Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. It said, One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, um, that might be referred to in your Bible as the Sea of Galilee. Depends on the translation, whatever. Doesn't make any difference. It's just where it was. And the people were crowded around Jesus listening to the word of God. He saw that the water's edge two, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. Now, the reason they were washing is I always have to explain this. Because today we've got synthetic things. Back then it was natural fibers. They had to wash it out because if they didn't, it would rot. So they were cleaning all the nets out. That's why I always say they were washing their nets. So they were busy doing what fishermen were doing at the time. And so they're washing their nets. In verse 3 it says, and, and he, meaning Jesus, got into the boats, one belonging to Simon. Simon, his, later, his name would later be Peter. Belonging to Simon. And asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from, it, from the boat. Verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Hang on, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught a thing, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that the boats began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' feet and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. And he said, and he and all of his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, sometimes referred to as the sons of thunder. They were, quite, they were rascals, uh, like most fishermen, right? Most fishermen are rascals, right? Is that what we, we are there? Anyway, it says, they were Simon, Simon's partners. And then Jesus says this to Simon. He says, don't be afraid. He says, from now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled up their boats upon the shore, left everything, and followed Jesus. May God read, bless the reading of his word here today. Let's pray together. God, I pray that you just teach us this text and allow us to give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' holy name, 
Amen. Did you ever come to a point in your life when you realized something had to change? Something had to be a little bit different? Maybe you looked in the mirror and you go, you know what, maybe I need to get a little healthier. Or, you know, uh, you looked in the mirror and said, uh, uh, maybe, I, uh, maybe I, I need to, uh, to read a little bit more and, and, and educate myself a little more. Maybe you just looked and said, something needs to change in my life. And then you took the action to bring about that change. Now, those things that are good, obviously, we want to hang on to. But those things that are not good, those things, and my, my, my biggest thing was I am addicted to cheeseburgers. I love cheeseburgers. Man, it doesn't matter where they're from. Everyone says, well, you got to go to Bates for the best cheeseburger. you got to go here. you got to go to Red Robin. you got to go here. You know what? I love cheeseburgers. It doesn't matter where I get them. They're all awesome. I even like a McDonald's cheeseburger. I know that's just like, Ugh. And she's freaking out right now because Dixie's been trying to help me get eat, eat a little better. But anyway, uh, I love them. But I realized something had to change. And so I made that decision and started getting away from that. I got these things called impossible burgers. And I know why they call them that because they're impossible to swallow. That's what they are, man. It's bleh. But anyway, there's some vegetable thingy. I don't know what it is, but nonetheless. So anyway... I had to make some changes, and so change sometimes is difficult. Sometimes it takes a little while. Sometimes it, it's painful, you know, but the fact is sometimes you have to recognize it's time for a change. Well, that's what was happening here, and I want to break this down for you and let you, and let you understand what it was that, that Jesus was going to change in Simon Peter's life, and I found that picture off the Internet that was a, a photo taken of Jesus and the disciples you know, when they were walking the earth. I'm kidding. There was no photo of Jesus and his disciples when they walked the earth. I just want to make sure you all are still awake here. It's all good. So what's the first thing I want to point out to you based on the text here tonight? The first thing I want to point out to you is that there had to be a change in the process. Now, Jesus is talking to a group of people on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. He's teaching them, and my Bible literally says, the Word of God. I love that. It wasn't just giving his opinion. It wasn't just giving his idea. He was teaching the Word of God. That's what we try to do here at Four Winds Church. That's why we always tell you, open your copy of God's Word. Open the Bible and read it and learn it and write little notes to yourself and circle little words and all that kind of stuff. I love doing that. I've got a bunch of Bibles through 30 years of ministry, and I go back and look at them, and some of the notes that I wrote and some of the notes that my wife wrote and all that kind of stuff, I, I kind of go back and chuckle because I didn't know anything way back there. I don't know much more now, but it's just funny what I thought was important back then versus what I think is important now. But anyway, just going back, and, but when you mark your Bible, that, that's not desecrating the Word of God. That's investing in the Word of God. That's writing things down and, and making, because so, I, I can't keep it all straight, but if I write myself a note or circle a word or say, go check this or go, here's a cross-reference for that particular verse, then when I go back later on, I go, oh yeah, I remember that. Sometimes there needs to be a change in the process. Now, Jesus was teaching the Word of God, and he's right there on the Sea of Galilee on the shore, but there was a large crowd. Nobody could really get around or close to him. And so he says, there's a boat right here, and he happened to be Simon Peter's boat. He says, hey, would you mind letting me get in your boat, and you just kind of push off a little way out into the water so I can talk to these people more effectively? Well, Simon Peter said that was no big deal, not a problem at all. And so he pushes out a little ways, and Jesus continues to speak. And now Simon been washing the nets and doing all the things that fishermen did, and they push off a little from the shore, and then he sat down and taught the people. And then verse 4, it says, When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now, Simon Peter had been doing what he'd always done. They went out fishing, they came back in, they were washing nets. They'd go out fishing, they'd come back, they would wash their nets. That's what fishermen do. They had worked all night, the Bible says, when Jesus says put out. He says, well, man, we've been working hard all night, and we didn't catch anything. And so they're doing all the things that they needed to do. But listen, Jesus is not in the habit of asking someone to do something that will fail. We've got to keep that in our minds. When God asks the things of us, when God begins to invest in us, when God begins to instruct us, he's not wanting us to fail. And so when he asks Simon Peter to 
push off a little bit out there in the water so he could preach a little bit better. Uh, and when he finished preaching, then he said, okay, now I want you to put out in the deep water. Jesus had a plan. Jesus had the opportunity. But immediately Simon Peter begins to protest. When Jesus was going to use Simon Peter's boat as a pulpit, that was no problem. But then when Jesus says, now let's go out and do some fishing in a fishing boat that belonged to a fisherman, all of a sudden the fishermen are like, no, 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 we're not going to do that. You see, there needed to be a change in the process. Simon Peter believed that he had it all figured out. He knew what fishing was about. He knew what he had to do. And he knew that what Jesus was asking him was illogical. I mean, Jesus, it's the wrong time of day to go fishing. And Jesus, it's the wrong place to go fishing. You don't go fishing in deep water. You go fishing in some place where the fish are actually hanging out that you can draw them in. But Jesus was about to do something incredible. So there had to be a little change in the process. Kind of have to ask yourself, if we would allow Jesus to change our process just a little bit, wouldn't he do something incredible as well? Maybe it's that missions effort that's been laying on your heart that you need to get involved with. Maybe it's that, 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 that reading to, to young children. Maybe you know, maybe say, Pastor, you know, I, I'd like to have a thing here at church after school. And, and we would just read to the kids and read to them things like the Bible and so on and so forth. Maybe God's asking that kind of a mission emphasis out of you. We don't know, but sometimes when we're asked to do something that may seem illogical, it is absolutely in keeping with God's plan for our lives. But you have to change the process. And Jesus is okay with that. Now, for something to be successful in changing the process, three things have got to happen. First thing I want to point out to you, there has got to be an acceptance. That means you've got to be willing to listen to what is actually being demanded. An acceptance of the message. Jesus had said, let's go out a little from shore and I'm going to preach. And then when he was finished preaching, he says, okay, now let's go out into the deep water. There had to be a willingness on Simon Peter's response. But he starts out by saying, you know, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. And then there's that word, but... And I've got that circled in my Bible, the word but. So Peter had said, okay, we've done this. We know what we're doing. We've been a fisherman our whole life. We, we've got, you know, this is okay. However, I am going to accept the demand, Jesus, that you're placing on me. I'm just going to do what you said. You understand Romans chapter 10 verse 17 tells you and I that we really need to take God at his word. Because our faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ, the Bible says. You see, sometimes the first part of changing the process is accepting what is being asked of us. A simple acceptance of God's direction. But once there's acceptance, then there's also got to be the second thing, which I would call acting. You can hear it all day long, but then there's got to be a willingness to move and, and to act on that particular thing. I see these parents sometimes that will tell their child, Now, Johnny, don't do that again, or I'm going to discipline you. Number one, a little three-year-old kid that has no clue what discipline means. Johnny, if you do that again, I'm going to discipline you, and then they never follow through. Well, what's that kid going to do? Going to keep doing the same thing. Why? That's what kids do. We don't listen. So one of the things is accepting the message. The other thing is actually acting on it. Johnny, if you do that again, you and I are going to go outside, and you're going to pick out a switch, and we're going to, no, I'm kidding. I'm, that's old school right there, and I'm not trying to make anything. But the fact is, when we hear from God, then we just can't say, okay, we actually have to act on that. The Bible tells us, don't just listen to the word, James chapter 1, verse 22 says, and so deceive yourself. Do you know what that means when you say that? To just listen to the word and not act on it is deception because you're basically saying, I hear what you're saying, but I really don't believe it. Think about that for a second. How many times have you heard what God was saying, but eh, I don't think I'm going to do that. I had a friend of mine, they, they, we were talking one day, and, and he was talking about the church that he goes to, and this was a long time ago. 
we were talking and about, uh, and I said, well, you know, the Bible says this. Because they were believing something that was not biblical. I said, well, the Bible says this. I said, what do you do with that in the Word? He says, we just disregard that part. That's a little frightening to me, to just pick and choose. Which I call that Dalmatian theology. You, you, you believe it in spots and then move on, that kind of thing. Don't just merely listen to the word and constantly deceive yourself because you're really saying, God, I don't believe you. Actually do what it says. And then you're really saying, not only am I accepting the message, but then I'm acting on the message. Which brings my third point here. Is the third thing about something to be successful, you're going to have to have the assurance of knowing by faith that which seems doubtful. Peter said, you know, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down my nets. He was willing to take Jesus at his word. He was willing to change the process and try something different simply because of the request of his teacher would be his Lord very shortly. Something to remember, God's power to provide is greater than our potential to perceive sometimes. Let me say that again. God's power to provide is greater than our potential to perceive. Sometimes we don't just, we don't get it. God, how are you going to do this? How are you going to fix that? How are you going to make this happen? How is this going to work? How, 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 how? We don't get it. But God's already got it. I was driving through, uh, uh, through uh, the upper state on my motorcycle the day, and I saw a sign, simple sign that said this, God's got this. Didn't tell you what it was. They just believed that God's got it all. God's got this, period. Sign in their front yard. That is someone that has assurance of knowing that God will come through. We've looked at this verse six times in the last four weeks. Faith is being sure of what we hope for, and we know that we hope for the return of Christ. That's not hope like wish cross my you know, feet, cross my legs, cross my finger. That's not it at all. It is the assurance of that long-awaited uh, return of Christ. That is where our faith is based on, being sure of what is hoped for and certain of what we do not see. Keep that in your head. Now, you may not be able to see it, touch it, taste it, smell it, but you still believe it. Why? Because you've got the assurance of Christ. We may not be preserve, perceive it, but he's powerful enough to do it, and he will indeed do this. We must be open and ready to receive the instruction from God. Peter said, okay, we fished, we've caught nothing, but because you say so, we will go out and we will let down that thing, let down those nets. In verse 6 it says, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Now, they didn't break, but there was that much strain on that. I see these big deep sea fishermen that are using these big heavy fishing lines to catch those 500 pound tunas and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I wouldn't even know what to do with a fish that large on, on a thing. But, but these guys were, were using nets to scoop them up and catch them all. He says, it was so many there, they didn't, they, they didn't even have a clue. So they get their friends to come over say, hey, bring your boats, man. Come over here. We need your help. And so they began to bring in fish and bring in fish and bring in fish to the point where they filled both boats to the point that the boats were about to sink. Now, they didn't sink, but they were about to, all because they took Jesus at his word. And it says that bo the boats were so full that they began to sink. So, Peter had to begin with a change in the process, which brings me, the, the second thing that happens here is a change in the person. Look what it says there in verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, saw what? Saw what had just happened, what had just taken place. He saw that they were empty nets all night long. They hadn't caught anything. They had a big goose egg in all of their effort. They put the net down and they drag it up. They put it down and they drag it up. They caught nothing. And Jesus says, put out a deep water, which was completely illogical. Put out a deep water, put that thing, put those nets down, and they bring in the largest catch of fish that they've probably ever experienced. The change in the person began when they saw 
what happened. Now, Jesus would later tell the disciples, say, look, he says, you believe because you've seen me. You know, Thomas, when Thomas saw him, put his hands on his, and, and touched his side and all that kind of stuff. He says, my Lord and my God. He says, blessed are you that you've seen me, but blessed are those who have not seen me and still believe. You know, sometimes you're not going to see what is happening until after it happens, right? You're not going to recognize it until years later. Some of you heard me tell you I lost a job. Big surprise there. I lost a job. Um, was doing well, making lots of money, doing a great thing, and I got caught up in some internal politics, and I lost my job. And I would—I'd been serving the Lord. I was singing in a quartet, and I was—I was in church every Sunday, somewhere doing something, you know. And I—and I lost this job. I mean, it didn't make any sense. And I—and I, of course, you, you go to God, and you kind of go, God, this doesn't make any sense. And you begin, I'm serving you. I'm doing all this. So you're gonna lose my job. What's going on? Ten years later after I'd gone to seminary, after I'd got my degree, after I'd started serving in church, I had a guy that came to me at the church, and he goes, he goes, Jeff, I don't know what happened. I went in my office and I lost my job. No forewarning, no nothing. I just came in and I was fired. And at that moment, I knew that I had lost my job so that I could minister more effectively to him and understand where he was. You see, that's one of the cool things about it is that, is that when you see something happen, you may not understand why it happened, but God knows exactly why it happened. And I was able to stand beside him and pray with him and encourage him and help him through until he found another job. Understand that we may not know why things happen, but when we do see them, we got to know that God is still working. God is still involved with that process. Peter saw what happened. And the minute he saw that, when, Peter saw, when Simon Peter saw this, look what it says. He fell down. Let me give you this verse before I go any further. The psalmist in Psalm 32, verse 5, the psalmist says, And then I acknowledged my sin. That word sin means to miss the mark. It means to miss the mark. What does that mean? Well, it basically means we're sinful. There's not a thing we can do about our sin in our own strength. We're never going to be able to get to God because of our sinful condition. The psalmist says, When I acknowledged, when I recognized that I was sinful by nature and by choice, and I, my sin, when I acknowledged my sin to you, in other words, he confessed it to Jesus and didn't cover up the iniquity, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave. And look at these next two words. You forgave the guilt of my sin. We oftentimes think about the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sin, I should say, singular. But we oftentimes don't always know that God wants to deal with the guilt thing as well. Because don't you sometimes look back over your shoulder and go, man, I wish I'd never done that, or I wish I'd never said that, or I wish I'd never responded that way. And sometimes we carry that guilt for a long time after we're saved. We were never intended to do that. The psalmist says, and you forgave the guilt. I didn't have to carry that anymore. I didn't have to be bothered by that. I didn't have to mull that over my head. I didn't have to be frustrated or, or angry. I was forgiven of that. When I finally confessed my sin to you, God, you forgave that part that I wanted to hang on to. And I'm so glad. Aren't you glad that he forgives us not just our sins but the guilt associated with the sin? You were never intended to carry that any longer. Peter saw what happened. He says he saw this, and what does it say? He fell at Jesus' My Bible says fell at his knees. I, I read it, and he fell at his feet. He got down in his face before Jesus. He realized that he was in the presence of the Lord, and he was convicted of his sin, and he recognized that he had kind of mouthed off earlier, and he had doubted and all that kind of stuff. But when he saw what happened, there's something happened. Something changed in him. And he got down on his face before Jesus. He said, oh, forgive me. He saw what happened. He says, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. A simple phrase that carries so much weight. A sinful man. What does that mean? And we're not just sinners. We're sinners by nature and by choice. But our sin has specifics, doesn't it? You know, you, when you steal something, you're not just... A sinner, you're a thief. And we know what the Bible says, that sometimes when you hurt someone's character, you're a murderer. You have to kill somebody to be a murderer when you try to assassinate their character. That makes you a murderer. So you're not just a sinner, you're a murderer. 
You're not just a sinner, you're a thief. You're not, you know, when you kind of get specific about the sin in our lives, then that conviction begins to kind of go, wow, what a train wreck. And yet God still loved us enough to forgive us of that sin. And all he says is just confess it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all the unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. The psalmist said, this is what happened. He says, Paul says, I mean, Peter says, go away from me, Lord. I can't even be in your presence. So he saw what happened with the fish. But then he saw what was also going on in his own heart. He recognized what a mess he was. He said, Lord, I am a sinful, sin-filled, really. I am a sin-filled man. The Lord's presence brings conviction. And Peter recognizes that he was not a man, not, not walking in faith. He was a Jew, but he didn't have a clue or what, what he needed to do, and that he needed to surrender to Christ. Isaiah was put in a similar situation. You might remember in Isaiah chapter 6, the Bible tells us that Isaiah was taken up into the throne room of God. He's able to see the throne room and God is there and, and the robe of God filled the temple that was everywhere. And when he came into the presence of God, Isaiah knew he was in trouble. Because in biblical times, if you saw God, the Bible, they, they believed that you would die. You would, you would be killed. But understand this. I, I got ahead of myself here a little bit. Let me go back and finish this up. The Lord calls men to repentance. We know that. The Bible tells us, unless you repent, you too will perish. Jesus' own words, Luke chapter 13, verse 3. That's the first step. You've got to repent. Turn away from your sin, turn to God. That's what repentance means. Turns away from God, turn away from your sin, and turn to God through faith. He calls men to repentance. Once repentance happens, then we can begin to claim the promises. We can begin to hang on to the promises. We can begin to understand that what God is asking of us is going to uh, do uh, pretty incredible stuff. We have to recognize that when Peter saw his own heart, it was like Isaiah. Let me just give you a verse here, by the way. The Bible says that as far as from our east is from the west, as he, as he removed our transgressions from us. We've looked at that before. North to south, you can go north, north, north until you get to the top, and then you're going south again. East to west, you can, when it says that, when you start going east, you'll never go west. You'll just keep going east all the time. That's what he's trying to say. Your sins are forgiven incredibly, never to be remembered again. The Bible would say there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. So the promises, as a result of repentance, is available to those of us who have received Christ. Well, Peter, like I said, is sort of like Isaiah when he's in the temple room of God. The temple room of God where God is there and there's all kinds of smoke and, and, and the robe and all this stuff. And how does Isaiah respond? He says, another change in passion, I'm still, still working on this. Why, did I get turned around here? I must have. Peter saw his heart. What I want to point out to you is Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. It says, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. You know what he was saying there? He's saying, I know I'm messed up, and I'm hanging around a whole lot of other folks that are messed up. I am totally, totally deaf uh, in, in a problem. And God, I, I, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. He, I'm doomed. Isaiah came under great conviction. Understand that Jesus would later restore Peter. But Peter was going to be the one that was going to deny Jesus three times. And Christ was going to restore him on the beach. And you know what they do? This is kind of cool. You go back and read John chapter 21 kind of cool part about that is just as Jesus filled their nets here when he first called Peter, when he reaches out the disciples after he's, he's risen from the dead and he meets them there on the beach and they hadn't caught anything and, and Jesus says, put your nets down on the other side of the boat and they bring in this huge amount of fish. That was Jesus' way of affirming once again that he was there with them. Peter saw his heart there and Peter would see his heart later on. You have to ask yourself when was the last time you searched your own heart. 
I did a funeral today. That's why I'm dressed like this, by the way. I, you, I am not doing this every Sunday, just or Saturday. I just want you to know that. But I did this funeral. And I get called to a lot of funerals with people that don't have pastors uh, or the elderly that never don't have a church association. So I get, I get those calls a lot of time. And, and, and one of the things that I say at, at funerals is I said, what is someone going to say about you? Because we're all going to have a funeral probably one day. You know, we're going to be in a box and someone's going to stand. What are they going to say about us? They're going to tell all of our hobbies that we did and, you know, the way we spoiled our grandkids and all that kind of stuff. You know, my heart's desire is that someone would stand up and say, he served the Lord faithfully. My only desire. See, that's what Peter was going to learn to do. Now, he was going to make a lot of mistakes. Don't misunderstand. But there had to be a change of heart. He saw what happened, but then he also saw his own heart. And that's what changed the person. And when you change the person, then all of a sudden you begin to change your passions, which is the third thing here. Verse 9. For he, is con he and all of his companions, James and John, we'll talk about that in a minute. He and all of his companions were astonished. The New, uh, New American Standard Bible says, for amazement had seized them. They were just blown away by this catch. They could not believe it. They were astonished by what they had seen. Now the heart, it was already beginning to change because that's why Peter said, I'm a sinful man. And they're blown away by all of this and the partners and James and John, the sons of Zebedee who were Simon's partners. When you begin to see the hand of God when you can't move, you can't help but be a be astonished. Psalm chapter 8, verse 6. The Bible says, You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, talking about Christ before Christ ever walked the face of the earth. All the flocks and the herds, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. Jesus was going to have authority over them to and all that swim in the path of the sea. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Ever heard that song? O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It comes right from the Bible. Go figure. I like songs when they come right from the Bible. Except that one that was back in the 70s. To every season turn, turn, turn. By the birds. We're not going there. But it was from the Bible. They were astonished at the catch. Not only were they astonished at the catch, but they were also astonished as companions. Not only was Peter blown away by what he seen, but James and John were blown away as well. And you know what's going to happen with all three of them? In just a minute, they're going to leave everything because of what has taken place. They're going to leave everything. Their fishing boats, their nets, their dad. James and John's dad, because they referred to him as the sons of Zebedee. Zebedee was going to continue to be a fisherman. James and John were going to go with Peter, and they were going to go and do what was next because their passion had been changed. You will see them show up, the three, I call them the three amigos, Peter, James, and John. They weren't Spanish, by the way. They weren't Hispanic, just so you know. Just want to let you know. In Mark chapter 5, the Bible says they were there at Darius' house. Now, you may not remember what that story was about, but there was a man named Darius, and his daughter was very sick, and so he came to Jesus and says, hey, can you come to my house? And Jesus says, I'm heading there right now. And then this woman who had an issue of blood, she'd been bleeding for a long, long time, she came up and she kind of snuck up and touched Jesus' robe and was healed. And Jesus says, I just felt someone touch me. And, of course, the disciples thought he was crazy because everyone was crowding around him. And, and he calls this woman out and, and basically lets her testify that she'd had this issue of blood and now she was made right and while she's spending time while he's spending time with that woman right there this people from Jairus's house come to Jairus and say Jairus it's too late your daughter's dead and Jesus I love this she's not dead and he goes and he heals her Peter James and John went with him that's all he would let go with them Peter James and John in Mark chapter 5 in Mark chapter 9 when Jesus went up 
on the mountain. There was uh, a Moses and Elijah and, and, and that tra at the transfiguration, and they're all gathered there. And Peter, James, and John are standing there watching Jesus interact with these guys. They're going to have a little business meeting right there. Peter, James, and John were there. In Mark chapter 14, when Jesus had gone off into the garden, Peter, James, and John were going to be there with him when he was praying his last night on earth. And they were there. You see, when Jesus changed their passion here, that led them to a life of astonishment. Astonishment. Which brings me to my fourth, first, my fourth point. Yes, Jesus uh, changed. <clears throat> Sorry, um, he, he changed their uh, position. He changed their their passion. Uh, he he changed their uh, the person. Obviously, the, the process. I couldn't remember what uh, my first point. I tell you, what's pretty bad at the end of the day when you can't remember your own outline. Then it brings us to our fourth point here, which Jesus changes the partnership. Oh, by the way, I guess I could point this out to you since I just mentioned it. I'm not doing very good tonight. I apologize. The mind is there, but it's not very much there. Anyway, fourth thing, change in partnership. Look what Jesus says there. So they were all astonished at the catch of fish, verse 10, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. So they're all blown away by that. And then Jesus says to Simon, Don't be afraid. What was Simon afraid of? Well, all the things he'd seen, it was just blowing him away. He couldn't believe any of this was seriously taking place. And Jesus says, I don't want you to be afraid because I'm about to give you something else. Everything's going to change. You've got a new partnership now. James and John are going to come with you, of course, but you're not going to be out there throwing out nets and trying to catch fish. No, no, you're going to start catching people. You're going to be fishers of men and women. You're going to tell them the gospel. There's a new partnership. Now understand, those who were called were called to catch. Understand that, right? You weren't saved just to get fire insurance and just kind of hang out and take up space. You were called to catch. You were called. I think it's interesting that if you think about it, Peter, James, and John had been going out and catching live fish that would die. And now Jesus is going to go out and have them catch dead people who are going to be live fish. Kind of cool, huh? They were called to fish. Remember how I said at the beginning of this, God never wants people to fail. He never wants you to, to blow it. He says, from now on, Simon, Peter, you and James and John and all the other guys I'm going to call, you're going to, you're going to go out and you're going to fish for people. And some are not going to receive that, and you're going to throw them back. I get that, but many are going to receive because of your message. Those who were called were called to catch, but also those who worked together went together. Again, it says they pulled up their boats. Verse 11, left everything. And I've underlined that in my Bible as well. They left it all. What are you trying to hang on to that Jesus is saying you need to let that go? You need to let that go so you can serve me. They left and went everything. They went together. The Bible would tell us that whoever believed Jesus would say, whoever believes in me as the scriptures have said, streams of living water will flow from within him. What does that mean? Well, when he gives you the Holy Spirit, he expects it to well up in you and then fill, flow out on everyone else. The message of Christ, the word of God, the opportunity, the compassion, all of the things that God has enabled you with and empowered you with. He says, now, go out together because there's fish that need to be caught. And, I, you know, I was kind of, when I first read this, I kind of had this announcement. Well, wait a minute. So you go and you put some bait out on the water and you throw it out there and you kind of entice them and then you hook them. Ah. It's not what we're talking about here. We are trying to give them something that they need, bread that is really life. The Bible says, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. We are trying to give them hope in a world that has no hopelessness. And that's going to come about because of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us that is going to flow out over the people we come in contact with. 
That's why God established the church. We don't do it on our own. We do it together. We do it together. Instead of fishing for flounder, Peter, James, and John became faithful followers. They went from, I wrote this down, I thought it was kind of funny. I, when you start doing this kind of stuff in your office by yourself, you laugh a whole lot, and no one else would ever get it, but I thought it was funny. They went from bluegill to being real, from bait to belief, from fresh water to living water, from perch to people, from catfish to catching men, from hooking soul to healing souls. S-O-L-E versus S-O-U-L-S. God changes things not for the sake of change, but that his plan would be fulfilled. He had to change the process. And then he changed the person. They changed the passion. And then Peter, James, and John became partners with Christ to do the most amazing thing in reaching the world with the message of God. And he lets us be a part of that. So ask yourself, does something need to change? And if it does, then change it. Because I know God is simply wanting to do something amazing if we'll simply be willing to leave everything behind and follow him. Amen? Amen. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father God, it's in the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit that we humbly, reverently, and thankfully ask to open the eyes of our heart. Let us see clearly. Are there things that need to change? I'm reminded of that psalm that I listened to this week by Tim McGraw, to live like you were dying. And it says in there, I'm a, am I a friend? I, I was going to be a friend a friend would like to have. I thought that was a good thing to maybe talk about change. I was talking about just living knowing that every day is a gift, an opportunity. Now, I'm not going to go jump out of any airplane like he did. But God, we do know that we were called to catch. We were called to, to actively be involved in the mission you've placed before us. And we go in your strength and in your power. So God, help us. Help us to do that very thing. And we'll give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. This is Pastor Jeff Noble, and I want to thank you for tuning in today. We've got a message from the Word of God that I hope will encourage you and help you in your Christian walk. If you've got questions or would like more information, you can go to fourwindslove.org. Again, thanks you. God bless.